Next, how Central Market defined downtown by its demand and its demise. Then, Chillicothe's world-renowned expert in paper making. And revisit the impact of the Big Bear supermarket chain. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime, marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. We're at the Ohio Craft Museum this week, where craftsmen display and sell some of the most unique wares in Central Ohio. Holidays, birthdays, any random Tuesday, if you need a one-of-a-kind gift, you want to come here. This episode has unique stories about commerce, from big bears to a world-renowned expert on making paper in Chillicothe. Our first story is about the rise and fall of Central Market, how it spurred a neighborhood and how its decline left a scar in the landscape of downtown Columbus. Pat and Gracie's is a local gathering place downtown known for American comfort food that's made fresh every day. You'll find burgers, salads, hot wings, tater tots, and a variety of creative daily specials. It's a great location to meet up with historian Jeff Darby to talk about the history of the old Columbus Central Market, a much-loved downtown food market which was opened from 1850 until it was demolished in 1966. And joining us for the conversation is Albert Thurn, who is a fourth-generation family member operating Thurn Specialty Meats, which was established in 1886, and Pat Groom, who was married into a family that owned the Thomas A. Groom Meats, a business that started back in the 1920s. I'm excited to learn more about this once great gathering space. Doreen, thanks for calling us together uh, to talk about markets in Columbus, especially the Central Market, which really was kind of the granddaddy of, of public markets, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and no, I am just delighted that we're all here and we're going to talk about this. It was built, what, 1850? 1850. It's actually amazing. And it's, it uh, originally had a location down on um, South High Street at Rich and was there for several years, and then they knew that they needed more space, and so they started looking for land and spent a whopping $2,000 to get the site up on 4th Street near town, mm -hmm. and that's when it stretched down the street. And it stood right at the west edge of 4th Street, didn't it? Right. Right along the street itself. It, it really is right along the street. So you have the stalls and you have the parking places, and it's really this great hubbub of activity. Well, Pat and Albert have first-hand experience right. in the market, so we're going to get some stories from them as well. Pat, tell me some of the things you remember about being in the market itself, what it looked like, what it felt like. Everybody was busy. Everybody was smiling when they would shoot those big white covers off of all the stalls. Mm -hmm. Everything was perfection. All the red meat showing, all of the produce, everything. And just the people, the way the people were. I mean, they were always so happy. There was never any grumbling, never any fighting, never nothing. It was just happy when you, you felt good when you went in, you felt good when you came out. When you oh, went smell. down to Central Market, yeah, the, the smell. smell. The oh, cheese in the stand next oh, to us. Oh my lord, it was, and outside all the, the people fruits the, at so Christmas time, you had the biggest oranges, the biggest grapefruits, the nicest selection of nuts. The smells of that fresh fruit and just how 
beautiful that stuff was. It seems as though that whole area around Central Market from, of course, I was arriving in the 60s, it's a little on the late side, but um, it was just a wonderful ethnic mix. And I know that there were a lot of Jewish families that were down there. They were coming in, the pollsters, the Wasserstroms, you know, that were, or also had attendant businesses um, that were there. So what do you remember about this wonderful mix of people? Because we seem to always think of Columbus as perhaps not having that mix, but we do. Everybody got along. That's the most important. They loved each other. It, it was, you go down there on Saturdays, and we were on the outside, and you could see three, four people deep on the sidewalks. You know, and everybody was come down on the, on the street cars or the city buses and, and, and bought their produce, and they would just, it'd be like a social gathering more than anything. Where these people came every week and socialized with each other, with the merchants. They all had their special merchants that they would go to. They knew that so-and-so was going to take good care of them. Everybody had a very good clientele going. So, Pat, um, your family firm was Thomas A. Grooms Meats, is that right? That's right. Now, when did that start and sort of how did it develop over time? I think it was in the early 20s, maybe around 20, 1923, 22, something like that. And it was T.A., Thomas Aloysius Groom. He worked very hard. They were a very poor family. They had five children. They had two boys and three girls. And I remember Joe talking about when he was seven years old, he used to go on market and help his father. They had delicious meat, and they would always give customers, you know how people give customer or give their customers maybe a uh, sucker? Oh, sure. They used to give a wiener. <laughs> so as a family business, your grandfather had actually pick this up from his father, from his right? father, yes. But you don't remember your great-grandfather. I don't remember. I hear stories of my great-grandfather. What is a good story of your grandfather that will be passed on in your family? I started working basically when I was nine, 10 years old with boning out meat and stuff. They never, they didn't think anything of OSHA or anything like that. Right. And my grandfather would stand on top of me and say, Butch, sandpaper those bones. <laughs> I mean, get all the meat off him is what he was saying. And he would pick all the bones that I threw aside and say, hey, you got to get a little more off of those. So he was a taskmaster. He was a taskmaster also. But he was, he had a good heart. He was very generous, too. Obviously, your family has such a long history with Central Market. We were there. What was the reaction you, when it closed? You, one of the pictures I had, we were there on Market for 79 years. And we left about a year before. 64 or 65 we left, I'm not quite sure. But I guess they saw what was happening. It was really deteriorating. The city wasn't putting any money into it at all. And they were discouraging everything they could to close it up. Mayor Sensenbrenner sent Low and Deck down there with a crane to knock five holes in the roof to get the merchants out because they weren't ready to leave. And it was just very disheartening. Yeah, I knew from some of the city council testimony at the time that the merchants had very much objected to the fact that although they paid relatively modest it was rental very fee, low rent. there was no reinvestment in the building, purposely no reinvestment. Yeah, it was going down since probably the late 50s and that. Central Market should still be there. It Other would have cities. been, or it would have been an asset for this city. Well, fortunately, we do have the North Market, and it certainly has been a plus for the city, but wouldn't it be great still to have Central? We've learned a lot today about yeah. Central Market, markets generally, meat cutting, so thanks to both of you. Right, I mean, thank you very much. A, thanks thank for you. having us. Yeah. Next, from a successful vineyard to an expert on making paper, we visit the Mountain House in Chillicothe. Then, rewind to a time when bears were the big attraction in supermarket shopping. 
I have no clue what this is, but I'm pretty sure I need one, and I'm definitely sure my wife needs one, too. Of course you do, and really, I'm with you. I love handmade gifts. There's a home in Chillicothe called the Mountain House that was once a vineyard, and then it was the home of an expert on paper making. We're just coming into downtown Chillicothe, the seat of Ross County, a really historic community settled in the late 18th century, 1796, by a settler named Nathaniel Massey. And Nancy, it has some of the best architecture in the state, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Not just the downtown area, but the residential areas. A lot of early 19th century architecture that you don't see in a lot of historic communities throughout the state. We're going up the hill, the big hill that's on the west side of uh, downtown Chillicothe. We're going up to visit a place called Mountain House, and we're going to be meeting Dart Hunter. This is the old family home. I've been looking forward to making this visit. Here we go. It is quite a house. <laughs> Hi, Dart. Hi, Nancy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, my pleasure. Hi, Jeff. We are so Hi, excited Jeff. to get this tour well, today. Shall we take a look? Absolutely. Come on in. Uh, I've been here once or twice, but uh, there's always another story to tell, isn't there? Right. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. This is wonderful. Oh, yeah. It's a great old house. Oh, look at this. Yeah, this was really the last room that my grandfather created when he uh, did his renovations in 1920 mm -hmm. after purchasing the house in 1919. These stained glass windows look like paper making? They are. They really uh, kind of study the history of printing and paper making. And these were made by your grandfather? My grandfather made these between 1925 and 1930. For this space? For this space. For his library. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then he was a figure in the arts and crafts movement. He the Roy was. Crofters, it's, it's all sort of the same thing, I think. Isn't that correct? That's correct. He uh, did many graphic designs, made all the leaded glass windows for the Roycroft Inn. Uh, he made pottery and jewelry. And, but there was one component missing from uh, that which the Roycrofters were doing, and that was handmade paper. So they were publishing books much the way would have been done you know, in medieval times, and they had a medieval look because they were importing papers from Europe. Mm -hmm. He thought that was kind of a tragedy. So he spent the rest of his life, really from 1911 on, doing nothing but studying the history of paper making, hmm. as well as uh, collecting artifacts from around the world on how other cultures had made paper. Do you have any other elements of the past you'd like to share with us? We do, we have several in the studio. Would you like to come Fantastic, in? Fantastic, of course. That's where all the work gets done. Yes. Oh, look at this so space. So this is the studio that my grandfather created. Oh my gosh. Uh, he chose these two Washington hand presses to use to produce all of his books. Really the same principle that Gutenberg would have had, a very simple platen that comes down to make the impression. That's remarkable. And then you, when you're printing, it's one page at a time. That's correct. I've pulled the last book that my grandfather produced here, oh. uh, Paper Making by Hand in America, which all eight books that he produced here were on different aspects wow. of paper oh. making. So this was really his magnum opus what a beautiful book. A lifetime oh, gorgeous. achievement uh, yeah, in the study wow. of paper making in America. So, And even the margins around it, it's almost like a border on a work of art. It just calls your So there were 210 life. copies of this book produced, all on paper that he had made wow. in his Lime Rock, Connecticut That's paper mill. Remarkable. And this is the mold that my grandfather used to make the paper uh, for the book. So this is a, an early European mold uh, with a removable decal. Uh, with a laid uh, wire covering with this watermark. So anywhere we have this, uh, we take wires, stitch it to the mold surface, mm -hmm. and that will create slightly less pulp in these areas, creating a shadow. So the pulp is the ground up rags That's and water, correct. and uh -huh. it's kind of a slurry that you... It is a slurry. You, we you dip, dip into the, uh, dip the it, vat, okay. and we shake it in all directions, so there's no grain direction in handmade paper. Uh -huh. So. What a process. Are these watermarks back here? These are watermarks that were made in the same paper mill that he made uh, the paper for that book. He was really trying to encourage sales of handmade paper, which during the Depression was quite a hard commodity to sell. I'm sure So it he was. was offering custom watermarks. Paper making is still part of what you do here? You still it make is. paper? It is. We, we think it's, it's very important to continue Okay, and then that. you do the printing, and you must have other, other lines of business as well that, we, that build on that tradition? We do. We actually started uh, uh, a business called Dart Hunter Studios. We work with a lot of artists around the country uh, who are working in the same styles of, of design as the arts and crafts movement. And, uh, 
We do that in our studio downtown. And we'll be seeing that a little bit later. You will, yes. Thank you. Oh, what a, what a building. What well, a thank space. You. Thank you. This is really interesting. Tell us, tell us about the building first. Well, uh, this was built originally as a canal warehouse ah. uh, serving the Ohio Area Canal. The canal came to the rear of the building. Boats would actually dock right against the building and they would unload and store their dry goods in the building. And then from 1900 until 1950, the uh, electric company had purchased it. And they installed all the cabinetry throughout the building, which worked out perfectly, perfectly for our use. For you. Yeah. yeah, so it really couldn't have been a better building for us. So this is where you have your offices, uh, but also your, your sales room. Your, I mean, people, people can visit here, make purchases. That is, is that correct. Right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's see the uh, sales room. Yeah. Come on in. So this is the home oh, yeah. of Dard Hunter Studios. Yes. That's actually what you call it. And right. these were all here, and yes. it's perfect. So yes. it's tile? Tell it, us about the This is all tile. ceramic tile. Some of it incorporates my grandfather's graphic designs. We collect a lot of different uh, tile makers around the country. And then we work with uh, other artists doing pottery, one doing the clocks. We have a line of china that uh, bear my grandfather's designs and that we make actually the frames here. Well, it's interesting how the designs from almost, what, over 100 years ago can also look very contemporary today. That's and true. there's still a great deal of interest in the arts there, and crafts movement. There is. We've been very fortunate to have a great deal of support uh, nationwide, yes. Yeah. It's, so. Well, it's a, it's a wonderful story, and it's a wonderful legacy that you're carrying on. Thank you. Dart, it's been just really great visiting. Thank you so much for, for having well, us today. Well, thank you. I it's really been a fascinating it. visit. Thank you, it's Nancy. just, we love Chillicothe. This really added to the experience of a great historic city wow. to actually get the story of your family and this beautiful art. Drilling down to some of those local stories is just one of the, one of the best things. Right. Well, I always enjoy telling them, so thank you. Supermarkets used to use all kinds of gimmicks to lure in shoppers. Big Bear had a real live bear. Here's our very own Brent Davis in the vault of the Ohio History Connection with more Big Bear artifacts. Hello, Cliff. Hey Brent, How good are to see you? you. Good to see you. Welcome. When I asked what Cliff has in store, they said a store. And I said a store and I felt like I was in an Abbott and Costello routine. <laughs> What's going on here today? Well, we've pulled some of our collections related to Big Bear. Ah, the beloved Big Bear grocery store. They didn't invent the supermarket, but they brought it to Central Ohio and Columbus, correct? Right, when they opened their first store on Lane Avenue in 1934, they introduced to Central Ohio uh, some, the whole idea of one-stop shopping. Prior to that, um, you would go to the dry goods grocer, you go to the green grocer, to the bakery, to the butcher. Mm -hmm. What Big Bear did in a very large store for the time, 70,000 square feet, provided all those things. And the other thing that uh, they provided was that you could select your own groceries. They gave you a little basket and you could go around and pick what you wanted from a variety of different things rather than have the grocer uh, take your list and uh, pull the items for you. Do we know why it's Big Bear and not Mighty Mastodon or something like that? Well, the man who founded the company, Wayne Brown, thought Big Bear sounded, you know, that it was something that was permanent, it was something that was big and large and impressive. So that's what he wanted to start his company with. Did people embrace the supermarket uh, style or were they reluctant to give up the old uh, style of shopping? It uh, was well received. The first three days of the, with the store's opening in 1934, over 200,000 Central Ohioans came to the store. And that's in a day when most people didn't have cars, so they had to get there by bus or streetcar or, or walking. So it was uh, very well received. You've got some pictures from the original store, correct? Yes. And it had an interesting life before Big Bear, right? Well, it had been, uh, uh, one of, among the things it had been, it was a roller rink. Apparently, 
uh, shoppers had to endure. There was a slight slant to the, the wood flooring as you were uh, taking your carts through the store. And Big Bear actually had a Big Bear in front of the store. And in fact, you have a, a family story about the Big Bear, right? Well, for the first couple years of the original store, they had a live bear outside that could uh, do tricks and uh, do small performances. And uh, my grandmother went to the original Big Bear. And my father, as a child, would ask uh, my grandmother to buy extra bologna so he could feed the bear <laughs> on the way out. Yes. Not only photographs in this collection, but also some objects, some three-dimensional objects. These were promotional items for the store, is that correct? Yes, and um, most of those are from the latter end of the store's history from the 1980s and 1990s. Again, these were donated uh, by some of the employees uh, around the time of the store's closing in 2004. Mm -hmm. The glass here, there's writing on the glass. What's with the glass here? Well, this was one of the novelties that uh, they gave out in the 1970s, <laughs> and it has... Uh, when CB radio was uh -huh. really popular. Gotcha, breaker, breaker. Yeah. And so it had all the different little sayings that people would say, uh -huh. you know, what's your handle, which I assume was what's your name, mm -hmm. catch you on the flip flop, so I imagine uh, see you when I return. Okay, yeah, so, I guess so, yeah. You should incorporate that language into official Ohio history connection correspondence. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Big Bear is also notable because a lot of people had their first job there or, or had a career there. Yeah, and that's, uh, there was a lot of loyalty to Big Bear. The company, when it was locally owned, uh, was very supportive of community projects. As a consequence, uh, it had a lot of support in the community. A lot of loyalty. Yes. Let's move down and take a look at some of these items. These look uh, not terribly old, like they're from maybe the latter years of, of Big Bear. Yes. And what were the last years of Big Bear? When did it close? The final store closed in 2004. Um, it was uh, purchased by an out-of-state uh, uh, conglomerate firm in 1989. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the company kind of lost some of that close connection to the community and that uh, strong sense of service mm -hmm. and uh, it led to uh, the company's decline. Mm -hmm. I like the hats. They look like they're suitable to wear when you're using the CB lingo on the glass. Yeah, a lot of these uh, types of things were worn by uh, the, some of the employees, and that's uh, the source of a lot of this material, is some employees that gave this material to us toward the end of the company's run. Well, Cliff, we know from stories we've done on Columbus neighborhoods that people loved Big Bear, and that uh, grocery shopping since it closed has almost been unbearable. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> Thanks for sharing these uh, items with us. It's a pleasure. Thanks for being with us, and remember, you can catch all of our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see all our stories on the WSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. Going to the grocery with my mom. I'm sitting in the cart as we roll along. Oh, I create some chatter, Mama hums a song, going to the grocery with my mom. She puts Bisquick and Ovaltine, sauerkraut and navy beans, Wonder Bread and butter in the cart. Oh, Maxwell House and coffee cake, Crisco and Frosted Flakes, and a little boy she loves with all her heart. Oh, going to the grocery with my mom Oh, sitting in the cart as we roll along Oh, I provide the chatter Mama hums a song Going to the grocery with my mom But the road leads on And the sea rolls in And things do change once they begin and the road leads on, yeah, that's life's plan. And a little boy grows up to be a man, going to the grocery with his mom. i
from up high and a can of pumpkin for a pie. We put crackers and pimento cheese, tuna fish and mayonnaise, Hershey bars and grapefruit in the cart. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by at American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Moortime, marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health, focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.